from the SiliconANGLE Media office in Boston, Massachusetts. It's the Cube. Now, here are your hosts, Dave Vellante and Stu Miniman. Hi everybody, welcome to this special presentation, the evolving role of the data scientist. Earlier this decade, Hal Varian, the chief economist at Google, sort of dubbed the, chief, the data scientist as the rock star role, the rock star job of the next decade, and it seems to be actually coming true. I'm here with Stu Miniman, uh, my longtime and often co-host, and our newest member of the Wikibon team, Jim Kobielis. Jim, it's great to see you. Uh, let's start there, let's introduce you to the team, those of you who don't know Jim. Uh, former Forrester, even before that, Network World, our days at IDG, <laughs> just coming to us from IBM. Big data, AI, cognitive, welcome. Tell us a little bit about your background. My background, well you summarized uh, the most recent. I uh, was at IBM for five years. I was their data science evangelist. Um, prior to that, I have a long uh, lineage in the analyst space. I was at Forrester. I was all things big data and data warehousing, business intelligence. I had been at Current Analysis, Burton Group. I mean, you mentioned Network World for a long, long time. I wrote a column for Network World as a freelance thing, um, starting in the late 80s. So I'm sort of re revealing my age here. I don't want to go too far down the road there. But I've been around the block in the industry for a long time with a lot of different focus areas. And at you know, Wikibon, uh, my core focus is all things app dev and uh, deep learning and AI and data science, which very much traces a a sort of a path of a continuity from what I looked at under IBM and previously. And you know, um, John Furrier in 2010 on theCUBE said the uh, data is the new development kit. And at the time, I sort of really didn't understand that, but it's, it's becoming true. Now, Stu, you guys were at DockerCon last week, and you're seeing, you know, is it DevOps, is it Ops Dev? But the role of, of development and operations coming together infrastructure as code, we're going to talk about that a little bit, but give us your quick take on what's going on. Yeah, here. yeah, Dave, so, you know, Wikibon started with a strong focus on storage, and we've seen in the storage world, it's not about storing the information, it's about how do we leverage that data. Um, in, in my background, in the networking side, you're talking about how, uh, you know, the analytics and real-time components and uh, understanding what's moving in pieces, you know, how that's changing it, and, you know, reminds me of what, you know, we worked with GE when they launched the industrial internet. So, you know, we've watched at Wikibon, Dave, that kind of launch of big data. Uh, a lot of that goes into now the machine learning and AI space that, that Jim knows well, um, that, that evolving era of you know, data is at the core of everything and that has such a huge impact on you know, all the pillars that we cover in Wikibon, especially you know, the stuff I work on, infrastructure and cloud, data is always at the core and center in the applications. So Jim, talk about so how the, this, this data role is, is developing. Obviously the, the data scientist, there's even the chief data officer, we can maybe mm -hmm. address that, but let's yeah. get closer to the, to the app application developer. What's the sort of spectrum of, of development and what's the process look like? Well, yeah, if you look at the eras of computing, it, you can sort of trace the evolution of, of computing by how, where does the logic, the application logic reside, and who develops that application logic and maintains it. Um, if you look at the very beginning of you know, computing, starting from Babbage or, or beyond, you know, it was hardware. Clearly, it was electromechanical calculators and tabulating devices and so forth. Around the time of the Second World War, we started to have stored program control computers. We had Turing and von Neumann and those architectures. And a new cadre of professionals called programmers, and now they're called coders, developed to specify the application logic in COBOL and 4G, you know, L and so forth, different languages. Starting around the turn of this millennium, or really, really the turn of this decade, we started to see a third era develop beyond the hardware era and the software era of application logic towards what you might call the, well, what has been called the cognitive era, where the, the application logic doesn't, there's, there's less and less need for it to be explicitly programmed, but as actually it's learned from the data. How is, it, how is the logic learned from the data? Through the, through the magic of data science, statistical algorithms, machine learning to identify predictive variables, to drive things like recommendation engines and next best action and predictive you know, applications and so forth. So data increasingly is the core engine, as it were, that's driving the development of the logic that's in line to so many applications now in the era of artificial intelligence. So data scientists are key developers in this new era. Okay, so you got the data scientists, but then there's this whole sort of spectrum of people who touch data. There's the data 
quality engineer, I guess the data engineer, which may or may not be different, even the application developer. You have so-called you know, citizen developers or low-code developers. So is this one person, multiple people? Is it arms and legs? Um, is it one person? Is it a unicorn? I don't think there are that many people who are so all capable, jacks of all trades and good at all of them. They could do every single thing you sketched out. But you know, there's a lot of smart people in the universe, so I'm not going to diss the unicorns that actually are there. But in fact, what we see in development organizations now is, is clearly a specialization in terms of the data era, the data science era. There are data scientists proper, I'll use that term, who, are, who build and train and test statistical models against empirical data. They're the ones who build regression models, and they're the ones who, you know, build uh, you know all the under other you know the algorithmic logic that goes into these applications. There are data engineers. They're the ones who will build the data lakes uh, that you know, on Hadoop or NoSQL and so forth that are used by teams of data scientists to build and test their regression and classification and natural language processing and machine learning and the other models. Um, there are, there's, a, there's a strong and continuing demand for coders, for programmers to build the business rules and more of the deterministic or declarative and procedural logic, you know, if then else statements and so forth that you need for a fully fledged application. But there's other specialties as well. You need subject matter experts in many, most data science uh, 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 projects. They're the ones who understand these solution domain that you're building these, 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 these models and applications around, whether it be marketing or security or you know, uh, autonomous vehicles and whatnot, you need experts to work with the data scientists to build the feature sets and, you know, and so forth. Um, there's other specialties that are critically important. Um, uh, data visualization design, user interface design, UX, Hardware engineering, more and more of like machine learning and deep learning algorithmic models are going into the edge applications that are residing on you know, IoT endpoints mm -hmm. to drive various automated actions and so forth based on fresh data and algorithms that are embedded in those components. What I'm getting at is that the development ecosystem of different roles continues to expand. There's a lot of strong need for coding, but data scientists, the core statistical modelers and explorers, absolutely essential in more and more disruptive applications, cognitive chatbots and, you know, and uh, face recognition and voice recognition, things like Siri, you know, we're all using, I use all the time. I, I write most of my text now using Siri on my iPhone because it's gotten scary good mm. at, at speech recognition. So That's everybody that. talks about the, the shortage of yeah. skill sets. Yeah. Um, how problematic is that in terms of growth? And, and Stu, we talk about the you know, ops dev, are they going to come from the operations world? Let's specifically focus on the, the, the enterprise. Um, are you seeing, like the guys you saw at DockerCon, are they moving into the data science realm and the, the data engineering realm, or are they more sort of doing DevOps type of, type of work? Yeah, I, I think on the infrastructure side, it tends to be more the, the DevOps uh, t type of folks. Uh, definitely kind of the coding piece uh, gets into a lot of environments, but uh, you don't see somebody that was like, okay, you know, running around data centers, uh, pulling cabling, uh, you know, tomorrow becoming a data scientist. Um, you know, remind me, Dave, of you and I did two years ago uh, with the MIT Sloan folks, the second machine age era, uh, talking about how has the first industrial re revolution kind of replaced uh, what we can do with you know, muscle, uh, we, we can bring machines in the second machine age is what's going to uh, e either replace or greatly augment uh, what we can do from a cognitive uh, standpoint. So that, that's going to have a huge impact on jobs. Uh, it's interesting, I look like, you know, Amazon's a huge hire. Uh, I think the number I heard is they're going to have 100,000 jobs in the next 18 months that Amazon's going to hire. Right now there's over 5,000 jobs open for the Amazon Web Services and a lot of them are using data, leveraging data. Um, Every new company that I see and job description I see is, right, how much is data part of what you're doing? It's what something, you know, from a research standpoint, uh, we, we always say, well, you know, uh, without data, you're just some guy with another opinion, right? So, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> y y data is just, you know, so infused in everything we talk about and how much will machines help us to grapple because we, we know the four Vs of data out there. I can't as anyone, you know, there's the unicorns out there that can, you know, read the matrix of flying information everywhere, but uh, 
uh, there's there's so much information coming in. Yeah. We need the, it's the tools and the people going together. You know, dramatic impact on what's going to happen. And, and right, we said if, if your job, if you were a storage person configuring LUNs or a networking person, you know, cabling things, you know, your job's changing. And you know, how do you get on board this wave and race with the machines, uh, not not fight against? Well, them. you brought up the yeah. second machine age. We did that event with uh, Bryn Yolfson and, and Andy McAfee from MIT. And Jim, you mentioned the cognitive error, it's kind of an IBM term, but yeah. one of the criticisms I've always had of IBM is that, that in, if you look at, you know, humans have always been replaced by machines, but mm -hmm. first time in human history, it's, it's increasingly been, is it being cognitive functions yeah, that are being replaced. Yeah, knowledge work. It, knowledge work, and IBM would shy away, and other vendors as well, oh, we don't want to talk about you know, replacing humans, but in <laughs> fact, that's what's happening. That's I mean, happening. I mean, you can argue very strongly that the middle class is kind of getting hollowed out, the median, the data supports it, the median income, you know, mm -hmm really has been flat or down, actually. Uh, and, and one could argue that it's due to, due to cognitive functions, you know, machines replacing humans. You might want to debate that. I'd be interested in your thoughts on that now that you're outside of IBM. But, but so, isn't it the data professional that is ultimately going to be allowing combinations of innovation to occur uh, and, and, and new jobs to be created? Now, whether or not they can be created fast enough to yeah. offset the decline in existing is, we'll see, but what's that's, your take on that? That's it? structural unemployment, clearly. There's displacements in any turbulent uh, and innovative industry. Right. Old industries die, sometimes they die quickly uh, before the new ones are fully born, understood. So, uh, no, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna uh, um, downplay the potential, the, ac the actuality of structural unemployment right now, as whole industries get hollow out and new ones get created. Um, and data and algorithms and AI and so forth are a major player in the realignment of all industries. Understood. So, um, you know, in terms of you know where the jobs are coming from, you know, you can say that everybody on some level will need to be a data scientist, but that's sort of overstating it. Everybody needs to get really savvy on data, and on the underlying, uh, really the, the enabler for delivering value from data, which is machine learning. Uh, machine learning models, more of those are being I built into applications everywhere and, and delivering new value. Now, there is a growing range of more, I would call them closer to self-service tools that allow, allow the rest of us, by which I mean business analysts and subject matter experts, to build more machine learning models and predictive logic on our own without needing a PhD data scientist to help us every step of the way. That niche of tools from any number of companies, including the one that you mentioned just a moment ago, are coming along, mm -hmm. uh, but I wouldn't say that the notion of a citizen data scientist, yeah. uh, <coughs> that's a tool, that's a term that's got parlance. Uh, I wouldn't say that um, this is necessarily a space that's dominated or will be dominated by the do-it-yourselfers. Right. But there is a growing range of people, especially millennials, who've taught themselves data science from the get-go and have become fairly effective at building and training and iterating machine learning and predictive analytics and so forth from open source tools like Spark and R and now TensorFlow, for example, for AI, who, and who built their own data lakes on top of like Hadoop and so forth, have, have been able to build really great data-driven applications, machine learning and so forth, from open data sets, of which there are more coming along every day, are able to assemble data science and developer teams from open communities like Kaggle, which by, by the way, Google, I believe, recently acquired. Yep. Mm -hmm. So there's more open resources to allow the motivated professionals who want to get deeper into data science and app dev in a data science world to do their magic and to do it without the traditional university degree or really with, without the traditional background in doing this work in, in, in the corporate world. That's coming along, so the do-it-yourselfers, there are a growing number of them out there, but I'm not going to overstate that trend. Th there's a serious learning curve to get really competent in data well, science. Well, and the hardcore data scientists hate that term, citizen data scientists. Oh, I know. But, but certainly there's a low code I've been flamed, trend. by the way, by many of them <laughs> when I've brought that up in a variety of industry forums and spoke about it. But well, know, that panel you that you and I did, I mean, it was, it was, it right. was with the 10 rock star data scientists. That's right. When that term came up, it was, you know, they just poo pooed it in totally. In your prior life. Yeah. So, <laughs> yes, in your prior life. But so, uh, uh, but don't you think that it's the really the survival of the physics? I mean, you're admitting that, yes, there's going to be disruption in, in vocations. Isn't it the survival of the physics? This is why, Stu, I get sometimes concerned about, you know, some of the, the public comments from, you know, President Trump about just sort of protectionism. I, I feel as though, 
you know, not to get political here, but hey, you know, learn, you know, get educated, you know, if we have to fund education, fine. But, but it's really the message to young people is you got to go out and, f and find those new opportunities and, and yeah. learn how to use data. Do you guys agree with that or? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah absolutely. I mean, I mean didn't we see this with cloud? With yeah. all the infrastructure guys well, who wanted to just provision lungs for the rest of their lives? Dave, I, mean, I think about when we talk about cloud, a lot of it is, you know, how do we shift things to a platform or a vendor? And a lot of it, data has gravity and is going to live in some of these platforms. You know, the joke we always have is, don't you think that, you know, the NSA, uh, Google and Amazon know everything you're doing and it's not just because I have an Alexa and Google Home in my house <laughs> and they're listening all the time, but, you know, they are gathering information, uh, you know, both of the, you know, Google and Amazon, both getting in the autonomous car vs. Amazon just announced that. So where the data lives, boy, you know, pe we talked about the disruption that Uber's going to have just because, you know, it went from kind of a full-time job of a taxi driver to a part-time uh, driver of Uber. Well, we know the real disruption is going to be when we just have fleets of self-driving cars and then nobody needs to drive anymore. So Okay, you know, so, so that brings me another yeah. question I have for you, Jim. The data scientist is building the data model and the yeah. data is informing that model and yeah. every cloud vendor says, oh, you, the data is yours. Yeah. But if the data is informing the model and the model is being applied in different industries and different use cases, how is my data, my IP, not feeding my competitors? <laughs> Well, if they don't have access directly to your data, they can't use your data to train their models. So if you've got the best uh, pool of r r data for a particular domain, whatever, you know, autonomous vehicles or whatever it happens to be, that first mover advantage into that space with that data, the data itself, is an asset that your competitors don't have direct access to. So their model, they can build models, but their, mo their data may, may not be as good or as fresh or as valid as yours. So their models will be less predictably fit to the application, the common application domain that you, you're, you're both uh, targeting. So keep in mind that the first movers, like, like I say, like Uber, whatever, who achieved the scale uh, first in a given space, they got that massive data set, the Googles of the world, the Facebooks. That is actually um, a barrier to entry for their competitors. You can't match a Google on you know, YouTube, for example, videos. It's, it's got YouTube, that was a great acquisition well, for them. Well, there's been a lot discussed about first mover advantage and, and the merits and or yeah. not of first mover advantage. Uh, and you could go back to the PC examples, uh, you know, so many examples of, of PC days, I mean the PC era of, of, of first movers who actually you know, went out of business. But right. is the first mover advantage because of data becoming more important? Now granted, Facebook wasn't the first mover, it was a Friendster or a MySpace, but Facebook yeah. now has a data advantage. Were they the, you know, the first data advantage is maybe a, a better way to put it. Is, is that notion of first mover, if data is the lever, going to sort of come back in vogue. Yeah, in and I, if I can build off that, you know, we, we talked about, Dave, kind of the customer innovation flywheel that's driven a lot of last generation. Right. Is data the next driver uh, of the flywheel? Well, so Amazon with yeah. cloud obviously has a first mover advantage. Now, Google wasn't the first in search, but they were the first to actually do search in a sort of data-driven approach as opposed to a portal, yeah. you know, as a destination. And so it, Uber is another really good example. You're actually seeing some examples of first movers, now whether or not it's sustainable, we'll see, but at yeah. the heart of it is data, right? Well, for example, Tesla has gone furthest to getting self-driving capabilities to a degree into commercial vehicles that are out on roads, and so they've got this growing pile of great data that is their proprietary asset for their team of data scientists to continue to tune and build and add additional self-driving features to their products. So, in other words, that's an example of a clear first mover advantage uh, that you know, they, you know, they, uh, they they squander at their at their peril, going for into that hot potential huge area. I mean, they've already, uh, don't they have a larger market capitalization now than GM? Which yes, kind of blows I my so, mind. I think they surpassed GM. Yes. Kind of blows my That's mind. Right. So they're, they're, they're Apple, but for vehicles. Right, right. Yeah. Okay, I want to sort of change subjects a little bit. You guys were just at DockerCon. We love the developer uh, uh, angle. You're going to be focused very largely on developers, obviously within AI and, yeah. and, and that data space. Uh, but Stu, you got OpenStack <coughs> Summit coming up. Yeah. We got Red Hat yeah. Summit next week. Uh, obviously, we a reInvent is a huge developer show. ServiceNow, an event that I'm going to be at, is actually talking about low-code developers, has quite a, a low-code developer community. Um, another one is DevNet Create. Cisco, right? Cisco. Yeah. Is uh, DevNet Create? It's an inaugural event coming up uh, 
May 23rd and, and, and 24th. Yes. Um, Cisco's angle on development, I mean, infrastructure as code, programmable infrastructure, some of the things that we touched on earlier, Stu. Yeah, What's the it, big it, trend it, there? It, Cisco's had you know a strong IoT angle for a long time. We know, I mean, the network's all about the data uh, th that's in it, and therefore, how can I instrument things better? How can I understand what's going on? Uh, there's so much you know real-time data. I know Jim, you probably real-time. We talked to it was buzzy for a few years, but there's now real times where that that real-time feedback is actually useful, not mm. just gathering or looking at historical information. But you know, Cisco's at the center of it. Uh, as, as we get, you know, orders of net magnitude more surface area from things like IoT, uh, mm -hmm. there's still the network implications of a lot of that at, at its core. Um, is, is network's background, but is Cisco's background, but, you know, Cisco has, you know, lots of software assets. They're a very large company with a lot of different pieces and definitely have been courting the developer and, group for and years. And they have this theme book, the Cisco, they're putting out uh, under DevNet, where apps meet infrastructure. Yeah, right, right. And so they're very much catalyzing a community of app developers um, around, you know, really billing on fog computing is another term that they, they, they put out there, which is a good one to describe the new generation, the new era of big data that's you know, entirely edge oriented, you know. So Cisco, you know, as an app dev, uh, as, as a provider of an app dev platform is a, something you have to get your head around because, you, you know, I'm one of the old school who thinks of them as routers and bridges and mm -hmm. hubs and all that, but that was way long ago. They're they're higher up the stack. Yeah, and, and actually, like, I fought against that FOG designation <laughs> when it first came out like two years ago, but we've seen the discussion was data center to cloud and now cloud to edge. Yeah. And so, therefore, if we're talking about cloud coming down to the edge, okay, FOG's an okay analogy. We understand there. Cisco sometimes is a little bit early uh, with some of their, uh, you know, uh, positioning out there, but I, I think we're starting to catch up with the reality of where it is. And Google uh, recently, related to edge applications, um, in terms of app dev, big part of the app dev process for data-driven applications is training those algorithms with fresh data to ensure that they are predictably fit for their purposes. Cisco, uh, not Cisco, Google recently came out with a very interesting uh, 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 capability, which is training of algorithms that are deployed at edge devices using a federated infrastructure. I did a, a, a blog a, a last week or a, I think it was last week or the week before on the Wikibon blog about federated training of data applications and where, where Google's going. But that gives you a sense for the new generation of app dev and, and dev ops, which is that more of the training. Training is basically maintenance. Mm -hmm. It's a maintenance activity. We become absolutely essential for all manner of applications from fresh data, that'll be sourced from the fog, and then, and then be pushed to algorithms that are being iterated and updated in real time out at you know, myriad, zillions of edge devices. So we have to get our heads around the fact that the data center is being radically decentralized. At a certain point, data center, the term itself, will be so archaic. We'll just, we'll just have to retire it. Well, it's all- Server farms. Right, plug into the API and- <laughs> There you go, we live yeah. in that API economy. All right, uh, we, we got to leave it there, guys. Thanks very much for, for coming on and, and chatting about that evolving role. If you care about the, the changing role of the data professional, follow, follow Jim, at, Jim uh, at James Kabilis, at James Kabilis, I-E-L-U-S, uh, at, uh, on Twitter. Get it right. And uh, go to wikibon.com <laughs> and uh, follow him there. He's writing, prolific writer. Great to have you on board. Great thanks, Stu, for, for participating. All right, thanks for watching, everybody. We'll see you next time. It's Cube, we're out.